Okay, this is the fourth one of our videos, and um, it seems to me it's been too hot to garden lately, to do anything except keep the garden watered and sort of sit around in it. So I thought we would talk about garden design, nice peaceful contemplation of what it takes to make a garden, the process I use to design a garden. So in my view, you know, leaving all the textbook stuff aside, I think there are three essential parts to garden design and the, the, there's the, the function, what you want to use a garden for and then there's your personal style. What kind of style do you express in your life? And then the third thing is what plants are you going to use? And people often get that wrong. They get the things in the wrong order. They start with the plants and it's not that the plants are the le less important. They are the most important but you have to get the other stuff right first. Let's talk about form and function. The question is, what do you want? I always start at that point. What do you want your garden to be? Do you want a safe place for kids to play? Do you want a private place where you can get up to dubiously legal activities and nobody can see you? Do you want to um, block out your neighbors? Do you want to open up a view? Do you want to grow a lot of vegetables or in like in my case just a place to hang out and relax and an excuse to grow as many different plants and flowers as you can find a home for. I think it's quite fun to make a list. I try to get people to make me a list of things you want. A woodshed, a paddling pool, uh, raised beds, a quiet place to sit, a place where you can get away from the kids, a place where you can play with the kids. Um, a, like canoe storage is, is big. Extra, another, you know, leaving space for a new garage. Um, the man kitchen. Um, all the different functional use elements that you want to have in your garden. And it's quite fun if you could make a plan of the garden to scale, to cut all these things out and have them as separate bits of paper. And you can sort of move them around. Woodshed there, paddling pool there, no, that doesn't work, you know, and move it around. So that, that is the, that's the use piece. So then we get to what your style is. And this is an important thing, again, to, to realize. Look inside your house. Are you all, you know, aluminum and glass surfaces? Or have you got frilly curtains and floral prints everywhere? Those are, there's no right or wrong. There's just personal preference. Are you somebody who likes lots of flower and color in high energy environment? Or do you want peaceful, serene, low energy and do you like a garden that gives you a lot of things to do or do you want to do as little as possible just walk out and sit in it and those are also things that people are inclined to overlook and and you pin people down to what what kind of look are you going for what 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 makes you happy as an environment to be in do you want things very clean and tidy or neat nick or do you like a little bit of organized chaos where everything just sort of happens serendipitously? When you've got those things figured out and you've done the textbook stuff of site evaluation, you know, you haven't got room for a padding pool and a canoe shed and a dog run and a vegetable garden. You've only got a postage stamp piece of property and you're going to have to make some hard decisions. And you've got, you know, poor drainage, too much sun, not enough sun. You do the, that sort of standard evaluation of what you're working with and how you're going to fit all the different elements in and now you get to the fun bit which is figuring out what plants to use and this is where you know this is where knowledge never ends this is where the encyclopedic understanding of plants how they behave what they do what they need to be happy um, what goes with what what kind of environment individual plants like how you can put them together which ones repeatedly fail and let you down, which ones are deeply reliable, the ones that I say um, work hard for their living, the ones that will, will pay you back um, every time you plant them. They will do what you ask them to do without complaining. And then there are other ones which make a fuss about everything and have to be coddled or listened to very carefully to get them in a place where they will thrive and be happy. And that to me is the, that's the juice of gardening. That's the fun thing. When you get something fussy and tricky, to be happy and to thrive, or you 
give up and decide that the bad bit of land is just going to be daylilies because the hell with it, I can't make anything else grow. All of those are very satisfying moments in making a garden. Given all these things, it, it, it's such a fascinating business because it is, there are so many moving parts. And I say that making a garden is worse than herding cats because you're trying to create art and a picture with things that don't do what you expect them to do. If you are decorating a kitchen or painting a piece of art, you can make it what you want it to be. A garden, you plant something that you think is going to be six foot high and it dies, or you plant something you think is going to be three inches tall and it turns out to be a foot tall, and you never know what's going to happen. And the, the, the unexpected is the fun. And it, is, it really is endlessly amazing and, and absorbing, and you never have full control, right? The idea that you have to give up control is very good for the soul, because gardens will take over and do what they want to do and not what you want them to do. Given all of that, one of the abiding principles that I believe in, and it's personal, it doesn't have to be anybody else's, but I think it's always worth considering, is that simplicity is nearly always better than complicated. I think that's true in art, in food, in fashion, in music, in in architecture and I, I think not in terms of rooms which is sort of the fashionable way to describe how you divide up your garden but I think in terms of departments I get the department of big things that like wet feet and the department of cute little woodlanders that want to be fussed over in a piece of carefully prepared woodland soil the department of hairy things that keep the traffic noise out the department of gorgeous drag queeny flowers that are close to the house and I can go and enjoy with my morning cup of tea or my evening cup of wine. Um, and so I sort of group things by, by, by character, by environmental need, by behavior. I think mixing plants I have plants that play well together and plants that don't play well together. And you put the don't play well together ones all together and they can fight it out. The things that fall over, that spread too fast, that are messy when they finish blooming, throw those all into one place and they can do their own thing all together. And then the nice things that behave beautifully all the time, that would get buried and swamped by big badly behaved things, um, can have their own little department. And so that's what, and, and it, that, that's the way I divide up my garden, kind of, sort of. And it makes it fun to go visit. You can go and visit the big hairy things and see how everybody's doing. Or you can go visit the little cute things or the big blousy cut flowers. And you, the, each one has a different um, sort of emotional content to it. of departments. This is from the Department of Shameless Hustle. I have a book out and um, it's in print and I wrote it and it's selling quite well and it is ostensibly about a murder mystery but it's actually about my experiences or, or a little bit that I learned about the life in the maple sugar camps up along the northwestern border of Maine with Canada. I work up there doing um, maple syrup camp inspections for organic certification and it's a fascinating piece of Maine that very few people know about and I thought it would be fun to write a story about it. So that was true, it was fun to write the story. Um, the book is out, it's available um, if anybody can get past the hustle and would be interested in reading it. It's available at, um, in, at Amazon but also at uh, Maine Authors Publishing. Um, and that's easy to find online, Main Authors Publishing, or Amazon, or Kindle, or even from me if you live close enough. So, um, you know, buy my book and enjoy the read. Thanks.